where creatures evolve into different kinds or whatever they are. He never tells us what a kind is, so I'm afraid I can't respond to the, whether kinds can change. I guess if I could, could show that they change, he would revamp his definition. So, in conclusion, I want to say that uh, we need evolution in our schools because it forms the basis for modern science and medicine. There is so much research going on on model organisms like yeast that should have no applicability to humans if there's no relationship between the two. But it is. Valuable advances have come from that. Applying evolutionary theory to the study of influenza virus has led to predictive ability to show how flu is going to change so we can make better vaccines. Those are just examples, but in conclusion, if we don't teach our students about evolution, there's no way that they can understand modern biology or medicine. Thank, Thank you. you. Is it okay? We will, now, we will now enter into a question and answer period which will last approximately one hour. We will give each um, individual two minutes to respond to the question. The first question, we'll start with Dr. Hovind. What does the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, um, help to conclude? The question is, what does the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, help to conclude? There are three laws of thermodynamics. Uh, the first one basically boiled down says something to the effect that matter cannot, matter slash energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be changed. The second law is a corollary of that which says that uh, in any exchange, uh, things become less ordered. There's something lost in every exchange. When you burn gasoline, there's an awful lot of it wasted as heat. About 30% goes to turn your wheels, and the rest is lost as heat, irretrievably lost. But since every, every known exchange uh, leads toward more disorder, the obvious conclusion is that the universe is winding down, and therefore there must have been a beginning. Typically, the evolutionist response will be that uh, this only takes place in a closed system. Well, I'd like to point out the universe is a closed system, unless you want to speculate some... Uh, uh, outside energy source outside the universe, they'll say, well, the sun supplies energy to the earth. Well, yes, I know, and it's 100% destructive unless there's a very complex mechanism to utilize this energy called chlorophyll. Uh, filling your front seat full of gasoline will not make your car run faster. You have to have a complex mechanism to utilize that energy called a carburetor system and a drivetrain, engine transmission, etc. So the, to, to argue that uh, Second law of thermodynamics can be overcome in an open system by adding energy is ridiculous. Adding energy only works if there's a very complex mechanism to utilize the energy. The sun will eventually bake the paint off your car, destroy the roof of your house, break up the concrete in your driveway. It's 100% destructive to everything on earth except chlorophyll. So before life is here, very complex life, uh, the evolutionist is really at a brick wall as far as explaining. The second law of thermodynamics is, is evidence there had to be a beginning and there will be an end, an ultimate heat death, and it could not have uh, created itself. Time up. Do I have a minute? Two minutes? I didn't quite follow that answer, but uh, the second law of thermodynamics does say that there's a difference, uh, that, and it's, what it says is different from what the creationists usually say, the second law of thermodynamics does say that uh, in a closed system, disorder increases. And living things are not closed systems, and that's why in living things, disorder can decrease. If Dr. Hoven doesn't know the difference between an open system and a closed system, I suggest he make himself into a closed system right now. Uh, stop eating, drinking, and breathing. Uh, and about 10 minutes from now, we'll check back and see if his disorder has increased. <laughs> it will. But the point is, disorder can decrease. Order can increase. It happens all the time. Whenever 
any living thing grows because it's taking in energy and food from its environment and this has nothing to do with whether or not evolution could have occurred or not. In fact, it could have occurred because the uh, uh, because order can increase and when energy goes in and as he said, we get energy from the sun. I'll stop there. Next question is directed for Dr. Paulson. Um, simple question. Uh, please explain the dating procedure of the geologic column. It's from Eric. Okay, the dating procedure of a geologic column. Um, I'm not a geologist, but from what I know, the geologic column was put together in the early 1800s, before Darwin. It was based on the observations of the guys who were building the canals around Britain, and they discovered that the in the cutaways for the canals, the same layers of rock were seen everywhere. Uh, and that had some practical usefulness for them because some layers of rock were more porous and they didn't want to cut into those when they were doing the canals. So they studied this and uh, figured out the layers, the different layers in the different parts of the country and how they corresponded. They also noticed that there were fossils in these layers and that some of them were, and that the fossils were found in the same, the, the fossils were distinctive for the layers. So the geologic column was putting together all these layers. Now not all the layers occur in every place, because not every place was building rock throughout the whole history of the earth, and some of the rocks have, have eroded somewhere along the way. But they could be put together, and that was before the theory of evolution came along, Later, it became clear why there were the different changes in the fossils in the different layers uh, because evolution had taken place. And much later still, radioactive dating came into play and that confirmed the relative ages. If all those rocks were laid down in the flood, it's quite astonishing that they formed such nice layers and that the ratios of radioactive elements just happened in all the layers to fit the uh, older to younger uh, pattern. I give a very long answer to this question on my video number four, uh, or you can get on my website, drdino.com, and get a long answer. He's right about the history of the geologic column, developed in the 1800s. Uh, Charles Lyell's the primary fellow in 1830 uh, with his book, but uh, they gave each layer of rock a different name, an age, and an index fossil. The geologic column is actually the Bible for the evolutionist. Everything must be interpreted in light of this geologic column. It can only be found one place in the world, that is in the textbooks. The geologic column does not exist, and they know that. If there were a column of sediments, unfortunately, no such column exists. There are a few places where you can find the index fossils in some kind of order that they, that they uh, have arranged, but that doesn't prove the geologic column exists anywhere. These layers of strata, like you see in Grand Canyon, all form very quickly. There are no erosion marks between the layers. If that layer sat there for 10 million years waiting for the next one to come on top, don't you think it'd rain at once or twice in 10 million years? I mean, there are no erosion marks between these layers. The geologic column all took place during the flood. I don't have time to cover all the uh, information we have on this, but geologic column is based on circular reasoning. Um, circular reasoning is where you use the fossils to date the layers, then you turn around and use the layers to date the fossils. This is exactly how it's done. I'll show you from their own mouth here. Um, page. 306 of Earth Science, or Glencoe.